Good morning, everybody, and welcome. Um, well, thank you. I'm looking forward to giving you this little insight into my journey today. I was asked to speak to you on the topic of turning my passion into a business. Um, I was very humble when they requested me to come and talk. So I'm going to start my talk today with one word. Do what you love and love what you do. Being an entrepreneur, as far as I see it, is a state of mind. I believe it's a genetic endowment. We spend most of our lives working, and it is very essential that we are happy doing just that. Entrepreneurs turn their hobbies or skills into successful businesses. It doesn't matter where you start, with a positive mindset, each step in your career becomes a stepping stone to bringing you closer to your ultimate goal and realizing your dreams. Remember, careers allow us to go from strength to strength. It allows progressive and positive growth, both tangible and holistically. And here is my story. As far back as I can remember, food intrigued me. From the meals I shared with my family at the small but exquisite Ma Sang's Chinese restaurant in San Fernando, to the doubles on a Saturday morning. My father owned a gents clothing and suiting business on High Street in San Fernando. And every Saturday morning, he would buy doubles. So you would just imagine, there was no begging me to go help him out on a busy Saturday. The doubles were enough to lure me there. And ladies and gentlemen, let me just tell you today that the doubles in those days were something else. Soft, pillowy bara with spicy, tender melt in your mouth chana fillings. Saturday afternoon sometimes found me perusing cookbooks and experimenting in my mother's kitchen. My culinary creations did not always come out great. Some of them were actually really disastrous. And my poor brother, well, he lived through many a taster's nightmare, being my guinea pig. There came a time when he begged not to be the taster anymore. I remember trying to make chocolate fudge when my mom was, of course, away from home. The fudge batter was so tough and so hard that I would throw it against the kitchen wall just to see whether it would break into pieces. Then I would wrap it in newspaper and place it in the garbage. Oh, I remember my first attempt at making guava jam, thinking I would go rustic and leave the seeds in it. Well, that was an eye-opener and a toothbreaker too. And my teenage attempts at making cakes and filling up the cavity because the cake fell with frosting. Imagination. I had a lot of that. But those failures in the kitchen didn't hold me back at all. Lots of my childhood and adult memories are centered around food. Whether it was my mom's delicious meals, the light and airy sponge cake we enjoyed while we were holidaying in Barbados, to the lamby fricassee in Martinique, the beignets of New in New Orleans, the lasagna in Tuscany, the macarons in Paris, and the creamy, delightful, fragrant hazelnut gelato in Siena. When on vacation, I would always sniff out the best food. Today, my travels still center on food, and it is often the simple restaurants with the home-cooked meals that are the most intriguing and delicious. A donut off the food truck in New York City, or a simple French meal in a bistro, a delicious wrap roti, a homemade piece of pone, or a slice of good home-baked bread. For me, food knows no boundaries. But imagine, when I was young, I never dreamed of a career in food and cooking. Believe it or not, I began my university career in an education in the field of geology at McMaster University in Canada. I used to dream in those days of putting on coveralls and going to dig for oil. But that was short-lived. After coming to my senses and listening to my inner voice, I studied business at Brock University in Canada. Upon returning to Trinidad, I started my career in marketing at Johnson & Johnson. After graduating with a degree in business and marketing and economics. That experience grounded me in corporate culture. I learned at that early time that hard work and tenacity would always bring results. I got hands-on experience in all aspects of brand management, marketing, sales, planning, finance, public relations, and human relations. I learned to write great proposals, learned about packaging design, new product introductions, budgeting. I was expected to be seen each morning on the factory floor liaising with team members 
I was expected to out any fires, and there were many. I was expected to design promotions that would bring in our sales quota each month. A wonderful, grueling, very hands-on, and very accountable experience, and I savored every moment. Three years later, I was back in Toronto, Canada, and it was my experience at Johnson & Johnson, coupled with my business degree, that enabled me to secure a position with Nabisco Brands in food marketing. My life would never be the same. My tenureship at Nabisco opened my eyes to food marketing, and that cemented my passion for food and the love of glamorizing food through recipe development, cookbooks, and photography. Toronto was at that time also going through a food explosion. New restaurants, exceptional chefs, exciting new ingredients, food shops were popping up all over the city from gourmet pizza to haute cuisine. Being a member of the marketing team in a blue chip organization like Nabisco allowed us many privileges, and many were in the form of dining at five-star restaurants. I could not be happier. After about two years at Nabisco, I realized that my happiness and satisfaction were really centered around the creative and intriguing aspect of food. I, descended, I decided then and there that I had to follow my dream and make food and cooking my career. I would open a small catering establishment. So I took the next step in my personal development. While still working for Nabisco, I enrolled and attended night school at the George Brown Culinary Institute in Toronto to earn my haute cuisine certificate. I then moved on to open a small food shop called Sweet Peppers Catering. I enjoyed that experience, but although it was food related, it just didn't satisfy the creative aspect of food that I longed to have. I stayed with it, and, but I also engrossed myself in the world of food through the newly emerging food TV. I took interested and varied classes with celebrated chefs. I explored wholeheartedly the world of food and cooking, experimented with new ingredients, and at the very least at that point, I had become an unadulterated, food-obsessed person. I realized then that owning a food business was not glorious. The hours were long and hard, but I was accustomed to that from my marketing positions previously. When the staff didn't turn up, I was a chief cook and bottle washer, but I was not to be daunted. I was happy and content being my own boss. Then I took the next step in personal satisfaction. I relocated to Trinidad with my husband and baby. At that point in my life, I became a ferocious planner. I returned with a career plan and followed it. Yes, it was a risk, a huge one, and it was also uncharted territory. Many thought I was crazy to leave a successful marketing career in Toronto to return to Trinidad. No one could understand what I saw as an opportunity. My passion and excitement was a fuel that drove me to my first accomplishments here. In 1994, I began writing the food column for the Trinidad Guardian newspapers. All my columns were centered around local ingredients, and I was prepared to write for free. I just wanted my name at that point to be associated with food and cooking on this island. But I became one of their columnists, and 18 years later, I am still their food writer. But dark days loomed ahead for me two years after I returned, my marriage fell apart, and I was left penniless with a baby to provide for on my own. But I was yet to be daunted. As the world-famous words of Nike resound in my mind, just do it, I lived my life just so. Resilience and tenacity, passion and fortitude got me through that time in my life and my family. You know the saying goes, it takes a village to raise a child? Well, that could not be truer. I had the respect and support of my close family. I learned then that everything that happens to us in this life happens for a reason, and there are always lessons to be learned. Behind every challenge lies a seed of opportunity. That experience has made me a stronger person today. You never hold your head, as we say here, and cry your woes. Never. I picked myself up, thought positively, visualized my outcome, and moved on. God provides a way and a light to drive our successes even further. I stayed on course at that time and followed my strategy for the short-term realization of my objectives and eventual realization of my long-term goals. I worked my schedule around my daughter's needs so that I could be there every step of the way for her and provide her with the most stable environment possible. I worked 24-7, but because I loved and thoroughly enjoyed what I was doing, it just never seemed like work. In 1995, the money I saved from my Guardian columns built my cooking school. 
All I needed were a few work counters, a stove, a sink, and an overhead mirror, and a few chairs. I was ready to conduct my first cooking class, and so the Wendy Rahamad School of Cooking was born. The school is fashioned around a Toronto cooking school, where students come, look, share, taste, converse about food, and generally leave satisfied and happy. It's an experience that I share with my students today, where I enlighten them on foods, both local and international. My goal then was to be the Julia Child of the Caribbean. After two years of food columns with The Guardian in 1996, I had enough recipes to publish my first cookbook. I used guerrilla marketing and sales tactics then to garner sponsors, and I published quick fixing recipes. The sales for the publishing of this book were secured by ads from businesses, and this was a time that I literally pounded the pavements to secure my ads. I worked 24-7, parenting and career building. Positive thinking and visualization were and still remain today one of the cornerstones of my success. Spirituality plays a great role in your success. Always strive to be the best at whatever you may choose to do and always ensure that your product is first quality. After publishing Quick Fixing Recipes, my Saturday afternoons were spent delivering books to booksellers across the country and sometimes doing small book signings. In 1998, I pushed forward another new product in the form of my recipe calendar. It was to be the first recipe calendar of its kind to Trinidad and Tobago, exceptional quality, peppered by advertising, peppered by appetizing food photos and supported by delicious recipes. Again, it involves selling to sponsors, managing the photography. I was and still am the food stylist for everything that I photograph, and I manage a full publishing of this calendar. I again accepted nothing less than first quality, from photography to design to printing. I arranged a contra with the Guardian newspapers that they provided the camera-ready artwork for me, and I branded it a Guardian calendar. They distributed it to their subscribers, free of charge. This calendar remains today the number one food calendar in the Caribbean. And I have many clients that have sponsored a month every year for the past 14 years. This is my pet project. I love the creative aspect of this product and work each year to raise the bar even further with respect to design quality. Simultaneously that year, my thoughts swung around to a cooking show on local TV. It helped at that time that a media food explosion was happening too. I produced a pilot and once again made my rounds to sponsors. The new concept of a local cooking show tickled their interest and so Caribbean Flavors was born. At that time, the production was a one camera operation, two lights, my camera man who was also my producer and myself. Good working relationships with my suppliers, trust, creativity, impeccable quality assurance and integrity are the qualities that enabled me to keep the show on the road 12 years later. We are now a crew of roughly six to eight persons. At that point in 1999, I raised the bar higher for myself and started the project of sourcing an international publisher for my next cookbook. This was just a dream of mine at the time because I knew high quality cookbooks were and still remain scandalously expensive to produce. So I dreamed of the day that an international publisher would publish my book. I knew this would be the only way to export my name in the international culinary world and entrench myself even further as the expert on Caribbean cooking. I wrote my manuscript and tracked down a name for Macmillan Publishers in London, England. The year was 1999. I literally placed my life in a FedEx package. Newspaper columns, cookbooks, calendars, even a tape of my cooking show. And hilarious, hilariously enough, it got to Macmillan but it got to the wrong office. The English publisher was kind enough to call me and ask me whether she should send it on to the Caribbean division. And I was so humble and so excited that she actually called me. I said, yes, please do, thank you. Well, after that, I was contracted by the publisher to have a meeting in Trinidad, and the contract for my first cookbook was signed. It's been 10 years since that first book, Caribbean Flavors, in 2002. After that came Modern Caribbean Cuisine in 2006. And last year, Curry, Kalaloo, Calip and Calypso, the real taste of Trinidad and Tobago. I was also contracted within that time to, to direct photography and style the food for three other international cookbooks. A Taste of Cuba, What's Cooking in Guyana, and a Home Economics Cookbook for the Caribbean. One of the greatest attributes to success is discipline. Discipline and balance in your life. 
balance between your family, your career, your spirituality, and discipline in what enables me to meet my deadlines. In 2002, I introduced another new product, the first gourmet food magazine in the Caribbean. At that time, the magazine shelves were crammed with foreign food magazines. I perceived the need for it and again put in my creative, organizational, and publishing skills to test. Caribbean Gourmet Magazine was launched in September 2002. This year will be 10 years and 35 issues later. In addition to managing my portfolio of producing, publishing, and teaching, I also do consultation for food companies in the capacity of recipe development, small cookbooks, and food styling and photography. Through the years, I have managed to broaden my perspective in food and baking through culinary courses in Tuscany, Louisiana, and New York City. My cookbook, Modern Caribbean Cuisine, has won an international award and has been recommended in the Chicago Tribune and the San Francisco Chronicle. Working in food for me is very dynamic and exciting. Creating a recipe is pretty much like a painting. You start with basic raw ingredients as your canvas, color it with herbs and spices, and the outcome is something quite spectacular. Even though my plate is full, my appetite remains ferocious for new ingredients, new tastes, new textures, flavors, and new ideas. And I know there will always be something delicious around the corner to keep me moving up. So before I finish, I just want to summarize what my thoughts are on becoming an entrepreneur. Know your product and believe in yourself. Don't wait for others to believe in you. Your self-confidence in your product will inject you with the passion needed for you to become a success. There is no such word as can't. Positive mental attitudes will mean a positive outcome. Be adaptable. Listen to your clients. If you can, massage your product offerings to meet their needs, then do so, and be prepared for change. Be honest. Work with integrity. Show your face. Much too often nowadays, we walk into small establishments, and the owners hide behind an office or are simply too busy to meet their customers. In this age of technological advancement, the personal or human touch, as far as I'm concerned, goes a very, very long way. Make personal one-on-one -on -one -on -one meetings with your clients. You will be surprised at how much can be agreed upon in that meeting. Have a vision for yourself. See yourself five or 10 years down the road. See each challenge as an opportunity, each downfall a lesson. Remember, what is to be will always be. We cannot change that. Be prepared to accept the responsibility of bad decision making. Remember, it is your business. Forgive yourself and move on. Always look forward, never look back. Get an education and continue to educate yourself in your chosen field. When faced with decisions, rely on your gut feeling. This is usually a very good indicator if it's a positive move for you or not. Get involved in social networking for your business. Never burn your bridges. Always keep an even temper and remain humble. Blow your steam off in your back room where no one can see you or hear you. Be creative when you move your product forward. Remember, Rome was not built in a day so your success will come in time to you. And always remember, have fun. You're supposed to enjoy what you do. It's supposed to be fun. When it stops being fun, you've got to question yourself and maybe tweak your business a little bit. As an entrepreneur, an entrepreneur is always imagining. We're always thinking of new ideas. Excitement lurks just around the corner as we dream up our next business venture, as I am doing right now. Thank you very much.